Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, welcome. On this channel, we post writing tips, unboxings, book hauls, book reviews, and the occasional vlog. And today, I went a bit overboard. So I have not one, not two, but three book reviews of kinda life, self-help, dealing with things, books. I went a bit heavy. It's unusual for me to read these kind of self-help books, but I had a really tough time last year and obviously we all had a tough time during COVID and I kind of had some lingering things that I needed to work through and I did find reading some of these did help. Two of them are books that I chose to read. Another one was actually sent to me by Anthony David Burnham as an ARC copy of his new book. My first one guys, so I have read it, I have reviewed it on Goodreads and I will also tell you guys about it on this video. We're kind of going through a bit of a uh, lifeline I would say, so we should probably begin. Before we get into reviewing these three kind of self-helpy life books, don't forget if you like what you see to subscribe to this channel. If you'd like to see as soon as I upload, click that little bell down below. Your continued support means a lot, so thank you guys so much. Three books that we are reviewing today are Man's Search for Meaning by Victor E. Frankel, Ikigai, The Japanese Secret to a Long and Happy Life by Hector Garcia and Francis Morales. Really sorry if I butchered that name. And the last one is The Ark I Was Sent, which is The Assumption of Death by Anthony David Vernon. Now, as I say, they kind of follow a bit of a theme. So I read them in this order. I read about logotherapy, dealing with things. Then I learned about Ikigai, which is how to generally live on a day-to-day -day basis in a happy form. And then I read The Assumption of Death, which deals with our perceptions of death. So we're going through a long life here, but we're gonna start in our review with Man's Search for Meaning by Victor E. Frankel. This book was actually lent to me by Matt's mum, Bev. If you guys haven't seen my birthday book haul, the link is above me now, that is when she gave me this because she bought me Ikigai for my birthday and she lent me this because as Ikigai followed a meaning of life, how to survive general day-to-day -day basis, she thought she'd give me a book that she uses for that exact purpose, which is Man's Search for Meaning. If you've seen my book haul of this book, you'll know my first opinion was, it's the Holocaust. What on that makes me want to search for life? What would make me happy seeing that cover? Which Bev found very funny because I was like, I asked for this book because I was struggling with some things, you know, like it's very happy, it's light blue, it's got some sakura blossom on there, very soothing. And then she gave me this. I was like, well, if I didn't feel bad to begin with, this is gonna make me feel even worse. But I didn't actually read both the books when I was in that situation. I read them now when I'm in a much better place, much happier, and I was able to deal with reading these quite brutal in some ways books. First of all with this book, Dr. Frankel is a survivor of the Holocaust. He was in Auschwitz, he was in many of the camps, he did get moved around, and he survived. Now, he believes that he survived due to partly, I would personally say, a lot of luck and being a doctor, and therefore he was taken to work as a doctor instead of continuing on digging, which even he admits he would have died within two weeks if he had done that for much longer. It is a very interesting read and he believes that part of the reason he survived was through logotherapy, which is his form of therapy, which is finding meaning in your life, not by looking into your past, but looking into your future and what you have to live for, i.e. someone in your life you need, want to provide for, someone you want to make happy, you have a piece of research, which in his case, he lost his life's work, it was taken off of him when he was taken to the Holocaust, and therefore his meaning was to rewrite that book. He wanted his work written down. So every scrap of paper he found, every small amount of energy he had left, he was trying to write down the research he had done before he was thrown into these camps. And he contributes that to a lot of the reasons he lived. And also from looking at other prisoners in the camp, you could tell when they were gonna die because they gave up hope and they stopped trying to survive. Because they gave up hope. Obviously this isn't always the case. You didn't exactly give up hope when you were horribly sent to a gas chamber. That was luck on whether or not you were sent there or not. But before I get into this book, I'll read you guys the blurb. One of the outstanding classics to emerge from the Holocaust, Man's Search for Meaning is Viktor Frankl's story of his struggle for survival in Auschwitz and other Nazi concentration camps. Today, this remarkable tribute to hope offers us an avenue to finding greater meaning and purpose in our lives. It then has a lot of great reviews. It has, if you read but one book this year, Dr. Frankl's book should be that one, which is Los Angeles Times. 
Victor Frankl is one of the moral heroes of the 20th century. His insights into human freedom, dignity, and the search for meaning are deeply humanizing and have the power to transform lives, which is Chief Rabbi Dr. Jonathan Sachs. Then our Victor Frankl declares that evil and ennui cannot finally extinguish us, a hymn to the phoenix rise in each of us who choose life before flight. Brian Keenan, author of An Evil Cradling. This is one of the most remarkable books I've ever read. It changed my life and became a part of all that I live and all that I teach. It truly is a must read book. Susan Jeffers, author of, the, of Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway, and then an enduring work of survival literature, New York Times. Let's review this book. First of all, preface one, why? I know this is like God knows how many editions of this book. This has been written and rewritten many times and the preface in it is just another psychologist big enough Frankl. Now, it's lovely that he loves Frankl. I didn't need that at the beginning of a book I was hoping would help me with life's meaning. And I don't think Frankl himself needed that. Obviously Frankl has passed away so I don't know his personal opinion on it, but I didn't need it. And also this preface seems to just everything is he, 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 he. And when you start reading Frankl's, he's not like that. And he mentions a lot of female psychologists that he respects their work. So why is the preface all in he? And why are we picking up Frankl? I've picked up the book. I must have some form of respect for the guy. Preface two is from the actual author. Now that was from when the book was republished again. And that was actually quite interesting. And one of the things that he says in his preface is, if hundreds of thousands of people reach out for a book whose very title promises to deal with the question of the meaning of life, it must be a question that burns under their fingernails. Frankel finds that worrying that so many people need this book because that means there's a lot of unhappy people who aren't satisfied with their lives. Modern day world. Another quote he says just in the first preface, for success like happiness cannot be pursued, it must ensue and it only does so as a unintended side effect of one's dedication to a cause greater than oneself. Which I really appreciate and it is true, if you start searching for success, yes there are people out there who probably searched for it and got it, but people do like real people a lot more. Next part, which is the longest part in this book, and that is ex experiences in a concentration camp. Now, horribly, because I am quite a uh, dark person, I guess. I was fascinated. I hated it. Don't get me wrong. Sick. Wrong. Why do humans do this? Why is it still happening? That's the real question. But I couldn't stop reading it because it is real and it is brutal and it is horrifying. It honestly happened and this is Viktor Frankl's true past. This was what he had in, happened to him in the concentration camps and many people that he met. Just read it. I would say, obviously, like I was when I first saw the front of this book, I saw the Holocaust and was like, why would this cheer me up? Why would this help me find a meaning? You must read it, but be prepared for it. It is gonna hurt. It's not pleasant, but you have to read it. I don't want to draw upon quotes from this section because I think it is a very personal part of the book too, Frankel that he has written down and he's written it down for the purpose of people reading his words, not someone else telling you about them. So I'm not gonna actually review the concentration camp section, only gonna tell you guys that you should definitely read it and be prepared to read it if you are gonna read this book. Now the fourth section goes into the teachings of logotherapy, which in a nutshell is like I said at the start, it is the idea of finding meaning in your life and that is what will make your life better. So it's not looking at your past, it's not doing the, oh, you must be depressed because this happened to you. It's nothing like that. It is whatever happened to you has happened and that's not going to change. So what is going to happen in your future and what are you going to build towards in your future to make, give your life meaning and give you a purpose to live for? And I did find I do agree with it. It does make sense to me, this logotherapy idea. And yes, you should deal with things from your past and you have to accept it. Part of accepting for me personally is accepting that that is what happened and now we can move on and we can do the next part of our life and have something to live and work towards. So I really appreciated that. Though a very difficult read, I would, as Bev did, suggest that people read this book. Don't read it when you're in a bad place. Just don't do it. Do not do that to yourself. But definitely read it when you're in an all right place, when you're prepared to read it. Read this book. I would give this book 10 out of 10 stars. Definitely a must read. And this, after reading this book, I then went straight into Ikigai. So this one I thought taught me A, a lot about the concentration camps. It taught me a lot about appreciating everything that I have. It taught me about working towards your future, about having something to live for, and generally how to survive. I then went into Ikigai. 
Now, Ikigai for me taught me how to prolong my life in order to do the things that give me meaning and also it does touch on logotherapy it is based on logotherapy's work and then goes to japan to okinawa which is one of the islands there which has the longest living lifespan of anyone in the world that is written down and why they live so long so we went from this will give your life meaning and this you have to find a meaning to live in order to survive and this goes into once you do have a purpose how do you keep doing that purpose for as long as you possibly can and how do you enjoy your life and generally get to the end happily so let me read you guys the blurb for this discover the japanese secret to a long and happy life with the internationally best-selling guide to ikigai the people of japan believe that everyone has an ikigai a reason to jump out of bed each morning inspiring and comforting this book will give you the life-changing tools to uncover your personal ikigai it will show you how to leave urgency behind Find your purpose, nurture friendships, and throw yourself into your passions. Bring meaning and joy to every day with Ikigai. And it then has this diagram on the back, which is generally how they believe that you form your own Ikigai. So this is a really easy read, as you can see. It is big writing, it's very small, and I really thoroughly enjoyed it. It just gave tips on how to live a longer and better life. And obviously, I was quite happy because I already do a lot of the tips so I was you know pat on the back there pat on the back as you do Meh. but I was very happy because it also gave me new ideas to try and it also emphasized things that I was doing but maybe wasn't paying enough attention to and it also kind of gave me some new life goals as well ones that I've sort of slowly been working towards anyway but now I definitely know I need to be a hobbit and that's all I need in life so I enjoyed it now one of the things that it does is it opens with a Japanese proverb. Now the proverb is, only staying active will make you want to live a hundred years. And I cannot agree more because a lot of the time, if you're just sat still and you're not doing anything, if you're not achieving anything, if you're not working for something, even if that work and for something is seeing your friends, then what are you doing? And I'm an introvert. I like sitting alone. I like being in my house alone or just with Matt. I'm fine with that. But we're also generally working towards something. We're either reading or we're filming or we're doing our music or we're writing or working in the garden, making delicious food. We're doing something. We're not all just sitting. And that is definitely something that is vitally important. I have found since reading this book, I now have a sit down office job and I used to always try and get up every hour to walk around a bit anyway. But now I also get up to stretch and I stretch every day now, partly because I do work out every day. And when I am in the office, I do cycle in. But I realized I, when I cycled to the office, I wasn't stretching. Why wasn't I stretching? So now when I get up to have a little walk around, I also do some stretches and it definitely helps. So the first thing this book tells you is that people live the longest, as far as we are aware, in Okinawa, which is an island in Japan. Now, Okinawa has a special place for me because my friend Kathy lived and worked there for two years and I love my friend Kathy and I miss her so much. We met in Korea when we were both teachers. I moved back to England. She went back to America for a bit and then decided to go back out into Asia and is in Japan. She's no longer in Okinawa, but after reading this book, I messaged her and was just like, seriously, what was the food like in Okinawa? Is this true? Were people happier? Did you know everyone was like older there? And in fairness, she did say she did think the food did have more flavor, but that's probably because according to this book, a lot of the food is freshly grown in people's back gardens. Who knew? The book is split into different chapters that deal with different parts of your life, basically. So the first one is anti-aging. This doesn't mean no wrinkles. It doesn't mean your hair's gonna stay a color. It's not about that. It's about keeping your mind and body active. I always remember in my family, we had my uncle Tony, who was technically not blood related. I remember visiting him when I was very small. And even though he must have been in his eighties by this point, my granddad was already very ill. Uh, he had a tumor in his brain. So we were slowly losing him to dementia, basically. But my Uncle Tony was still jumping up and down off the floor. He was bouncing around. I'd never seen someone that age, that full of life. It was amazing. And this book kind of touches on that because my Uncle Tony was a chef aboard my granddad's ship. He had a fantastic diet and oh my God, could you tell? A few other things that this, uh, this anti-aging section picks up on is 
Stress ages and ultimately kills you. Stress is not good for us, and in the modern world, as this book does say, it's getting more and more prominent. People are a lot more stressed because of many reasons. Partly we work very long hours, now both people in a couple work, so when you are off work you have to do the chores, you have to cook, you have to clean, you have to do all the things that someone else would have been doing whilst you're at work. So we have a lot on our plates. We also have a lot of things going on. We have global warming, we currently have a war going on, just we've had a pandemic. Personally, I don't agree with a lot of governments right now. There's a lot of stress and we're also on call all the time. We carry mobiles with us everywhere. At any point, we can be called up. We have emails pinging constantly and this really goes into that and how stress ultimately is not good for you and it gives you tips on how to limit that stress. On page 28 to 29, it basically gives you a rundown of that chapter of just a go-to list if you ever forget what you need to do to stop this from happening. We then go into logotherapy, which I won't go too much into because we've just reviewed Dr. Frankel's book, but it talks about logotherapy and it talks about finding your meaning and having something to live for. A lot of the older people in this book, they're still, they're not working for someone, but they have their vegetable garden that they work on, or they're volunteering somewhere, or they just, they have a routine where they do this in the morning and then they go to see their friends in the afternoon, they're always moving and they're always busy or working towards me. And also a lot of people in the rest of the world became artists in their older age and were selling out. They became authors. They were still working just for themselves. The third chapter is about finding flow. What that means is we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. This kind of links into what Dr. Frankel said about you don't search for greatness. It's something that happens when you are searching for your ikigai, basically. So you can become a best-selling artist, not because you are sending it out all the time, but because your art is really good, because that's what you live for. You do it, you achieve it, you keep working towards it. In this chapter, one of the major things I took from it is we basically learned that multitasking is not a thing and it is really, really bad for us. They did a study where they had people who would routinely multitask and people who didn't, and they had to find, they had all these blue shapes and then the red shapes, and they had to pick out the red shapes. And at the start, everyone was equal, and by the end, the people who multitasked could not find the red shapes as quick as the people who didn't, because the people who didn't multitask, their brains focused quicker because they were used to focusing on what they are doing. And it does say that, in order to become great at something, you need to find that flow. And that's something a lot of artists, such as Miyazaki, the creator of Studio Ghibli, apparently you couldn't speak to him if he was drawing. You do not go near him, he is drawing. And I feel that is such an important rule to make as well. Me and Matt are trying to make the rule of if you see one of us writing, you do not disturb them, you don't go near them, you turn around. Because just having someone hover on your peripheral vision will pull you out. And you don't need that when you're trying to be creative. You also have microflow, and that is making a routine of things. So by having a routine, you know you've got things done. We then go into Masters on Longevity, and this is a fantastic chapter. It's basically just interviewing people who have lived a long time. And definitely it seems the secret is just to be, accept what you are and what you have, be happy with what you are and what you have, and generally you live longer. All these people are just really happy. And it's really refreshing to read about elderly people who are happy, and they're also really proud of their age and really happy to be old. They class being old as a gift. It's a good thing. And something I have definitely seen in this country is a lot of older people will be like, oh, don't get old, aging is crap, it's awful, everything hurts. That's not the attitude we wanna be hearing because then you're gonna be scared to age. We're all going to age, so find something good in it. On page 98 to 99, it talks about the Japanese health service and it's something that I do miss from Korea as well. So every year in Korea, you had a health check. So the general idea in Asia, unlike in the West, is instead of dealing with a disease or a problem when it happens, you get regularly checked, like your cars get an MOT here in England, which means you find the problem before it becomes a major problem. And they have contributed to that partly to people living longer because if you can find a problem before it becomes major, then you can maybe stop it from happening and you can stop it from happening without the use of really severe drugs, without hospitalization. You just change someone's habit earlier. That's something I really would love to see here in the UK more is 
the prevention of illness rather than the curing of illnesses once they've happened. Obviously we need to cure illnesses and keep working towards that, but it would be a lot better if we all knew something was coming before it crippled us. On page 122 to 132 is just the dietary bible. It just tells you exactly how to eat healthily without feeling like you're starving at the same time and just it's so easy to do. It's just multicolored plate, non-processed food, just make loads of vegetables with a carb and a protein. You're done. And it even says to limit your protein to three fish a week and rarely eat. Like, we all know this, don't bother with the red meat. Or if you do, it's, it's like eating a cake, having red meat. You don't need meat on every meal. You can't digest it, so really good. And a diet improves your lifestyle greatly. I've, since I have improved my general lifestyle, I exercise at least an hour a day. I eat a lot healthier. Everything we make, I don't buy soup from the shop, I make it. We don't buy cereals and things. We have fruit salads for breakfast. And for tea, we're making sauces from scratch. We're making curries from scratch. We do big batch meals that we freeze ourselves. We're not generally having that much processed food. and. Oh my God, can I tell? I have so much more energy now. I've been living like this now for since Christmas and I've lost weight. My energy is back up. I no longer feel like exercise is a chore. but I look forward to my exercise every day. It's how I de decompress after work and just, it's working guys. I am so much better. After that, it then gives you the stretching and morning exercises, which is what I was saying about before, which is what I've definitely started to do at work. And oh, so good. Basically, I am fangirling pretty hard now, so I'm gonna shut up, but it's my Bible. So, if you hadn't already guessed, I give this book 10 out of 10. It's just a good kind of how-to guide. Frankel is a kick in the teeth, sort it, find your meaning, find your ikigai. Once you've found it, you'll have a reason to live. And this ikigai book is, once you have a reason to live, how do you just make sure you're as healthy and fit as you can be for as long as possible, so you can enjoy life for as long as possible. The elderly people in this book were quite often still doing sports, they were still moving every day, they were all exercising like small amounts every day, going for walks every day. That's the kind of old age I want. So two 10 out of 10s. And we now have the last book in my kinda life binge, and that is The Assumption of Death by Anthony David Vernon. Now this was sent to me as an ARC, that's why it's a printout. You can get this book on Amazon, I've reviewed it on Goodreads if you're interested in that. Now, after reading about how to have a long life, how to enjoy my life and all of that, I thought when um, Anthony emailed me and asked if I would be happy to review his book, I was like, well, actually, surprisingly, even though this isn't what I normally review, this kind of fits into it because we're just following my whole life. So we've gone from finding your meaning, how to live a long, happy and healthy life, and now how to basically deal with death. I was intrigued when he emailed me, so I thought I would read it. It is not my usual read and it is not like the other two. The other two feel like they are a guide to help you achieve these things. This one, as Anthony described to me, is more of a philosophy and an idea. He's questioning, do we actually die? And he believes that we are told that we will die and no one questions it and that he would like to question, do we? What I did feel about this book is that I, it's kind of given a lot of opinions, but it's not necessarily backed up enough for me personally, but it is an interesting question. So. If you are interested in this book, I would recommend reading it maybe as a group and you just read one page at a time, which trust me, will not take you long. Some of them are two lines long, but read it a page at a time and then discuss that page. It's not a book to just sit and read by yourself. It's something that should be discussed. So I did actually ask Matt to read it too, so that we could discuss it together. First of all, I did find a lot of the longer stories, which by longer, maximum three pages, had a lot of telling and weren't necessarily the best written. I'm not a philosophy student though, this might be the norm. However, as someone who's not used to reading that, possibly needed more show and versus telling, but a few of the shorter stories I did quite enjoy. Now, the first one, which is called Chain. Existence is a chain. Its links are life and death. Its materials depend on the wielder, which I said food for thought. Matt said life is what you make of it, question mark. For me, this sort of didn't deal with death. It was about life. 
which, yeah, I read it similarly, of your life is what you make it, but that didn't seem to deal with death for me, though it is a meaning and one that I definitely do agree with. We then have another one, which again, I thought dealt with life, which is regret will not change what happened. Regret cannot alter circumstances. A spider must work with the web they weave. Fallen trees do not care who hears them. The sun does not think of what will feel its warmth. The wind does not pay attention to what it blows down. True, you have to work with what you're given. Matt did disagree with the web uh, metaphor here because he said a spider, a spider can remake a web and they do routinely, but you get the gist of what that is meaning. From four, we start dealing with death a bit more and it's just a question. The whole way through, we're just questioning, is death real? Does death really happen? Which I'm gonna read number six for you guys because Matt has put a tick next to it So I presume he enjoyed this one. It is one of the greatest delusions of the average man is to forget that life is death's prisoner Wrote Emile Curran, but why can it not be so that death is held captive by life? Perhaps death can be kept away by life perpetually for life can occur without death But death cannot occur without life yet the belief has arisen that life and death necessitate the other no, life necessitates only itself to be life, while death is the one in need. Therefore, death is life's prisoner. This was a really refreshing and nice way to look at death. So I do agree with Matt on that tick. That was an interesting um, short there. So ultimately with this, I don't want to go into too much more detail because as I say, each story is quite short. So you've had a few examples there. I won't read the longer ones because they are three pages, but for me, it's not a book I would necessarily go back to, but if you're a philosophy student, you may get more from this than I did. I thought it was a book that would be interesting to discuss, but do agree with Matt that it gives a lot of opinion of saying that death does not exist, but then does not back it up. But then at the same time, how do you back up that opinion? No one knows what happens with death. So an interesting read. And I would give this one a five out of 10 stars, mainly because I want the longer ones to show not tell and also I am not qualified enough in philosophy to tell you if this is a good philosophy book or not. But look this guy up, The Assumption of Death by Anthony David Vernon. Definitely do look it up. If you see it, give it a glance over, see what you think. I would be interested to hear from other people who've read it to see if I am missing something then. I do apologize if I was, but for me just needs a bit more evidence and a just a little bit better written stories, but some of the shorts, like the ones I read, were quite beautiful to read. And that's it for this quite large book review. So we had Man's Search for Meaning by Victor E. Frankel, which was a 10 out of 10. We have The Ikigai, The Japanese Secret to a Long and Happy Life by Hector Garcia and Frances Morales, and that was a 10 out of 10. And we had The Assumption of Death by Anthony David Vernon, which is a five out of 10. We basically went through life its meaning, how to live longer, and then do we actually die? And that's it for this life learning experience for me. If you like what you see, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more from this channel, hit that subscribe button. And if you'd like to see as soon as I upload, click that notification bell. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or Tumblr. I post your bookish pictures as well as my writing tips and unboxings on there. And thank you guys so much for watching. Bye.